And for everyone else, if you're not a child, you can turn with me to Psalm 93. Psalm 93. Verse 1, the Lord reigns. He is robed in majesty. The Lord is robed. He has put on strength as his belt. Yes, the world is established. It shall never be moved. Your throne is established from of old. You are from everlasting. The floods have lifted up, O Lord. The floods have lifted up their voice. The floods lift up their roaring. Mightier than the thunders of many waters, mightier than the waves of the sea, the Lord on high is mighty. Your decrees are very trustworthy. Holiness befits your house, O Lord, forevermore. Let's pray. Lord, as we give our attention now to your word, we pray that you would help us to hear you speaking, help us to hear what you're saying to us. We need to hear from you, Lord. We need to hear from you again and again and again. So make us good listeners and good responders. We commit this time to you, Lord, in Jesus' name, amen. If you're visiting with us this morning, we've been going through a series this summer called 12 Psalms for 2024. And we have only two sermons left in our series in the Psalms, and I hope our time spent in these 12 psalms has been a blessing to you and has stimulated growth in you as it has for me. We need to always remember that as we encounter the word of the living God, and that's what we do when we gather here and hear from God's word, as we encounter the word of the living God, the author of that word, the Lord, is always looking at us and expecting a response. So coming to church and hearing God's word is actually not a super safe thing to do because the Lord who gave us the word is always looking at us and expecting a response. And he expects a response for his glory and for our good. That's part of his goodness to us is that he expects a response. Psalm 93 is a kingship psalm, and it's actually the first in a series of kingship psalms, 93, 94, 95, all the way to Psalm 99. These are all kingship psalms. There's more than that in the Psalter, but there's this interesting cluster of them right here in the 90s. These psalms are about how the lordship, and they are about the lordship and rule of Yahweh, and what that means for us on the earth right now. As we've already seen, the kingship of God is a major theme in the Psalms and of the whole Bible. Jesus' own teaching centered upon the kingdom and the rule of God. So brothers and sisters, when we read a psalm like Psalm 93, we need to pay attention and we need to listen carefully. And we need to realize that when the Bible talks about God as king, it isn't peripheral to what the Bible is all about. Or in the words of Gen Z, it isn't a side quest. 
when it talks about God as king. We need to realize that when the Bible talks about God as king, it is extremely important for our lives. So what does the Lord want us to see and respond to in Psalm 93? What's unique about this psalm? Well, Psalm 93 speaks peace to our fears and wisdom to our perplexities. It speaks peace to our fears and wisdom to our perplexities. Do you remember what Jesus said in Luke 21 when he was telling the disciples about his second coming? And I'm going to turn there. Luke 21, verse 25 and 26. And he says here, There will be signs in sun and moon and stars, and on the earth distress among nations in perplexity because of the roaring of the sea and the waves, people fainting with fear and with foreboding of what is coming on the world. Jesus is describing what it's going to be like in, in the days before his second coming. People will be fearful. People will be distressed. People will be, will be perplexed and afraid of what seems to be coming on the earth. We are living in a time like that, aren't we? When fear of the future is dominating people's lives. And what Psalm 93 is telling us is that we should confidently trust in God and unceasingly worship him because, and here's the reason, when it seems like the world is falling apart, when it seems like his purposes, God's purposes for us will fail, the Lord's unconquerable reign ensures that it won't. That's what Psalm 93 is telling us. Let me say that again. God is telling us that we should confidently trust in him and unceasingly, don't stop worshiping him, because when it seems like the world is falling apart and his purposes will fail, his unconquerable reign ensures that it won't. So let's walk through this psalm again, and we'll do it in three steps and see the goodness that God has for our fearful hearts here in this psalm. So first thing we see in Psalm 93, the Lord really reigns. Right out of the gate, Psalm 93 declares the reign of God. Let's look at that again in verses 1 and 2. The Lord reigns. He is robed in majesty. The Lord is robed. We're going to come back to this and talk about what this, why the emphasis here on him being robed. He has put on strength as his belt. And then skip to verse 2. Your throne is established from of old. You are from everlasting. You know, one thing people want to know in a crisis is who's in charge here? And the question is one we might ask when we look at the state of our world. Who's in charge here? Is anyone in charge here? Who does the Bible say is in charge here? Well, it's interesting. The Bible actually gives several answers to this question, several different answers, and we need them all in order to understand what's going on on the earth. On the one hand, Scripture teaches us that human beings are in charge here. Do you remember? God created man in his image as the pinnacle of his earthly creation, and God gave to humanity dominion on the earth. We read this in Genesis chapter 1. That is, God delegated authority to humanity to rule the world as his representatives. And boy, did we blow that bad. Why is the world such a painful, tragic mess? Because we humans, in a sense, are in charge here. And we who were supposed to take care of the creation, we rejected God's reign over us 
we loved lies more than the truth, and we plunged ourselves ourselves and this world into misery, futility, darkness, and death. And we continue to persist in this insane rejection of God today and bring more devastation on our families, our nations, and ourselves. The story keeps repeating. So that's part of the answer of who's in charge here. There's a sense in which we are. But that's not all scripture says about who's in charge here. Listen to the following verses. John chapter 12, verse 31. John 12, 31. This is the words of Jesus. Now is the judgment of this world. Now will the ruler of this world be cast out. John 14, verse 30. I will no longer talk much with you, for the ruler of this world is coming. He has no claim on me. That's clearly not talking about God. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 4. The God of this world has blinded the minds of the unbelievers to keep them from seeing the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. Ephesians chapter 6, verse 12. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against rulers, against authorities, against cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil, in the heavenly places. And one final passage, 1 John chapter 5, verse 19. We know that we are from God, and the whole world lies in the power of the evil one. The scriptures show us here that Satan, an adversary of God, a foreign usurper, has seized power in this world through lies, and by lying and deceiving, he tyrannizes humanity, taking them captive to do his will. This is part of the answer of who's in charge here, who's running things around here. And the Bible says, in a sense, Satan is. Satan is over this present darkness, dominating and tyrannizing this world. But, but, the Bible leaves us in no doubt whatsoever about who really and ultimately is in charge here. Psalm 93, verse 1. The Lord reigns. Over Satan, over humanity, the Lord reigns. And when God delegated authority to humans upon the earth, he never for a moment relinquished his right to rule, nor his power to do so. And we see that all throughout the Bible. So no, we, do, we reject any notion of the idea that the, that the Lord created the world, gave it to humans, and said, see you later. He did give authority to humans, but he never for a moment relinquished his right or his power to to rule. And when God permitted Satan to test and tyrannize humanity, he in no way ceased to rule sovereignly. And Psalm 93 joins a loud chorus of witnesses which testifies that over heaven and earth, the Lord God Almighty reigns. And this fact should inspire courage in God's people and fear in every rebel. Everything that happens on the earth Everything that happens in heaven is seen by God and will be judged by God. One theologian put it this way, there is not a maverick molecule in the universe. Nothing is out of control. Everything is under the authority and the power of the one and only God whose throne is established in heaven. Whose throne is established of old. Psalm 93 verse 1, the Lord reigns present truth now we americans are not used to anyone reigning are we 
For us, our political leaders do not reign. They are not kings, but they are employees of the people. They exist to do our will, the will of the people. But that is not how it is with a king. And I think, honestly, cultures in the past and societies in the past who had kings understood verses like this better than we do. A king is not elected. A king reigns permanently. A king has subjects, those who are under his authority. And the concern of a king, according to the Bible, is not ultimately to do the will of the people, but it is to do the will of God, leading the people in proper worship of God, doing justice, and providing for the well-being of those under the king's protection and care. And God's priorities may not be the same as our priorities. God does not exist as king to do our will, but as a good king, he does will us good. And for this, we marvel and praise his name. The psalmist goes on to say that he is robed in majesty, verse 1, the second line. And notice he repeats that. He is robed. There's an emphasis here. And we're quick to skip over it. What does that mean? Well, this isn't just some poetic way of saying that God is majestic and strong. And I think that's how most of us would probably quickly interpret that. He's just poetically saying he is majestic and strong. But when the Bible says that God is robed and robed in majesty, it means that God has shown himself publicly to be majestic. When the Bible says that God has put on strength as a belt, it means that God has publicly shown himself to be strong. Clothing is a public matter. We put clothing on because people see us. We put clothing on to be seen. If someone is clothed with shame, it means they've been publicly shamed. And if someone is clothed with majesty, it means they've been publicly seen as majestic. So the robe of God is what the world has seen of God. This verse is referring to God's public historic deeds by which he has made a name for himself in the earth as the king. The psalm is referring to events in the Bible like the Exodus, where God showed his arm and made a name for himself in the earth by spectacularly destroying Egypt and miraculously delivering his people out of slavery. When Israel came out of Egypt, all the other nations of the world trembled because they had heard that God had tur- their God had turned water into blood, had slayed the firstborn in Egypt, and had drowned Pharaoh's army in the sea. So we need to understand, it's extremely important to understand that Psalm 93 is not simply declaring without evidence that the Lord reigns. The singer is not simply singing what he hopes is true. The psalm is declaring what Yahweh has shown to be. He has shown that he reigns time and time again. He really reigns. No, really. Don't believe it? Look at history. Still don't believe it? Don't mess with him. Because he's going to show it again and again. That he is the living God who acts in this world. He has shown himself majestic. He will show himself majestic. The Lord is robed with majesty. He's got our attention by what he's done. And verse 2 tells us that the Lord's kingship has the venerableness of age. His throne is as old as eternity past, and it's established for eternity future. It says here, your throne is established from old, you are from everlasting. He is king, he's always been king, he always will be king. And while we know that at the second coming, Jesus Christ will bring into the full experience 
the kingdom of the Father on the earth. This psalm is not talking about the kingdom which is to come, but the kingdom which has been and which is now and which always will be. The Lord reigns. So that's the first thing that we see in this psalm. The Lord really reigns. Now, number two. We see here in Psalm 93 that the Lord's reign ensures the stability of the world. Now, this is really the main implication of the psalm. In many ways, this is the main point of the psalm. Look at verse 1 and 2 again. And notice how these declarations of the Lord's reign sandwich an important implication in, at the end of verse 1. Yes, the world is established. It shall never be moved. Did you see that? How the statements of God's kingship at the beginning of verse 1 and in verse 2 surround the conclusion that the world is established and will never be moved. In other words, these two verses in their very structure are a picture that the rule of Yahweh protects the world from destruction. Notice also that the word established is repeated twice in verses 1 and 2. The world is established. Your throne is established. The point here is that the world is secure because God's throne is secure. Brothers and sisters, nothing is going to ruin the world, nor God's purposes for the world, because the throne of God isn't going anywhere. If the world were destroyed, it could only be a failure of God's rule, and that is impossible. And the Psalms and the prophets are eager to make us understand this point. Look at Psalm 96, verse 10. Again, this is in that cluster of kingship psalms, but here's Psalm 96, verse 10. Say among the nations, the Lord reigns. Yes, the world is established. It shall never be moved. He will judge the peoples with equity. So the psalm, a different psalm repeats the same point. Or look at Psalm 75, verse 3. And be encouraged by this. Psalm 75, verse 3. When the earth totters and all its inhabitants, it is I who keep steady its pillars. And Isaiah says the same thing in Isaiah 45, verse 18. Isaiah 45, verse 18. For thus says the Lord who created the heavens, he is God who formed the earth and made it. He established it. He did not create it empty. He formed it to be inhabited. I am the Lord and there is no other. But why do we need to hear this again and again and again? Because there are many things causing people fear today, is there not? Climate change, nuclear war, tyrannical government, World War III, deadly viruses, the spread of Islam, cyber terrorism, out of control asteroids natural disasters, and the list goes on and on. People are afraid. And many worry that such things pose an existential threat. Have you heard people talk about that lately? An existential threat to our planet and to humanity. Meaning that the very existence of the earth and of humans is in danger. But the people of God who listen to his word know better than to fear that. What's the worst case scenario? What's the worst thing that can happen to our world? God still reigns, and his purposes will stand. The world is established. It shall never be moved. And even if a disaster were to happen, and they often do happen, even if a big disaster were to happen, God's people can still 
take comfort and not fear that the Lord reigns. He is in charge. He allowed that to happen, and it will not result in the failure of his purposes. You remember when the Lord in Genesis promised to never flood the earth again? And he put the rainbow in the sky to remind us. He, he really wants us to know this. He's not going to destroy the earth like he did in the flood. And he didn't only promise not to flood the earth again, but he actually promised that there would never be a cataclysm of any sort like that global flood that would destroy the earth and all the things in it again. For listen to what he says in Genesis chapter 8 to us. In chapter 8, verse 21, he says, I will never again curse the ground because of man, for the intentions of man's heart is evil from his youth. In other words, even our sinfulness will not change his promise. Neither will I ever again strike down every living creature as I have done. While the earth remains, seed time and harvest, cold and heat, summer and winter, day and night, shall not cease. Now, none of this means, brothers and sisters, that we should be irresponsible. Humans have been entrusted to care for the world, and we can cause a lot of pain by acting foolishly. But we also need to know, and this is important in an age of fear, lest we lose our cool and give in to fear, that we cannot so botch this job that God has given us that we would ruin the world and God's plan for it. God is still in charge. It's his world. And we serve under him. He is not an absent Lord. The choices that we make as we exercise our lesser authority, must always consider his instructions and his purposes, but must be made without the anxiety of thinking that the weight of the world and the destiny of the world rests upon our shoulders. So you can just breathe easy about that. Verses 3 and 4, look at uh, Psalm 93, 3 and 4, because these verses confirm for us that this lesson about the Lord's reign and its implication about the stability of the world really is the point of this psalm. The floods have lifted up, O Lord. The floods have lifted up their voice. The floods lift up their roaring. Mightier than the thunders of many waters, mightier than the waves of the sea, the Lord on high is mighty. This is a highly poetic passage, and even in the English, you can feel the water rising. The poetry heightens the intensity of the feeling of danger here. And we see here that the waters are scary. Notice the emphasis on the noise, the roaring, the thundering, the voice. The singer hears the thundering of the waters, which threaten to sweep him away and everything that he loves. How many of you have been to Niagara Falls in, on the border of the U.S. and Canada? It's an impressive place to go, isn't it? And I've never done that. I've been to Niagara Falls several times, but I've never gone on the boat that takes you up to the waters. And even if you had, don't go on the boat, it's loud there at Niagara Falls. But I imagine that when you go on the boat and you go up to that water, I mean, there is so much water coming over that cliff, pouring down, thundering and roaring. I mean, it's powerful. But Psalm 93, 3 and 4 is telling us that Niagara Falls is nothing to God. I mean, he could just stick his pinky finger into that fall and just, he could reverse the falls with his pinky finger. He doesn't even need his finger. He could just, a puff of breath and all that water would just go backwards and dry up. Yes, significant troubles and dangers will come. The floods do rise. There are Threatenings are heard. Floods have come in the past. Dangers have come in the... They come in the present, and they will come in the future. But listen to what the Lord's word says. 
mightier than the thunders of many waters, mightier than the waves of the sea. The Lord on high is mighty. And I just want us to take a little inventory in our hearts. Because I know that probably most of us follow the news and see what's going on in the news. In your heart, who do you fear more? All the scary things that you hear on the news, all the threatenings, all the roarings, all the thunders, or the Lord himself? What's mightier in your heart? How does your heart respond? How does my heart respond when we hear of all these things that could happen or are happening? Or maybe they will happen. Do we fall into perplexity and fear? Or do we remind ourselves, mightier than the thunders of many waters, mightier than the waves of the sea, the Lord on high is mighty. What a comfort for God's people. What a comfort for us to know that the Lord rules over anything and everything that can be thrown at us. What a comfort. And that's the comfort that God wants us to have from this psalm. And I also want to pause and make an application for our own personal lives as well. Because while there are troubles that the world as a whole faces or our society faces, I understand that there's troubles that each and every one of us face in our own personal lives. And although this psalm is focused on the stability of the world, other scriptures apply the same truth of God's rule over the individual lives of his people as well. In other words, because the Lord reigns, each and every one of his people are established and secure and will not be moved either. The floodwaters of doubt, of sin, of guilt, of condemnation, of fear, and the wrath of God also threaten to overwhelm and, dis overwhelm and destroy our souls. Satan lies to us. He accuses us. He wants us to despair, doesn't he? But what is true in verse 4 for the world is true for everyone who trusts in Christ. God is mightier than those waves too and whatever Satan may throw at us. Because Jesus came into this world, because Jesus loved his people and died for their sins, because Jesus paid the penalty for us and rose from the dead, and because he ascended into heaven far above all powers and rulers and spiritual authorities, we who believe in Christ have freely received by his grace salvation, forgiveness, adoption, union with him, and eternal life, and we are established and secure forever because his throne is established in heaven. We shall not be moved, for Jesus Christ is the Lord of our lives. And I want to encourage us with that as well, because I know it gets scary as a Christian too. Where do you go when you're, when you're struggling with Satan's accusations? He can make a pretty good case, can't he? Where do you go? Where do you flee to? How do you get above those floodwaters? We're, we are safe because we're standing on the rock of Christ. Brothers and sisters, the world is in good hands. And we, God's people, are in good hands. And God is not indifferent to what happens on this earth. The Lord is above the world, before the world. He's ahead of the world. He's within and beside it. And he looks after the world for, the, for his glory and for the good of his people. So we see here that the Lord's reign ensures the stability of of the world and his people and his purposes. And finally, we see in this last verse, verse 5, that our response to the Lord's reign should be confident trust and unceasing worship. Confident trust and unceasing worship. Your decrees are very trustworthy. Holiness befits your house, O Lord, forevermore. The psalmist here, in view of the reign of God, 
and the stability of his purposes says, God's word is trustworthy and he should be worshipped with holiness forever. Brothers and sisters, we all have to trust something, don't we? And somebody. The question is not whether we trust, but who. Who are we trusting in? Whose words will we rely upon and build our lives upon? We all want to build our lives, but upon whose words will we build them? Unfortunately, in the history of this world, the majority of people are deceived by lies, by Satan's false and flattering words, and they build their lives upon those words, and it's all going to come crashing down, as Jesus said. God's people know better because the Lord reigns and is robed in majesty. The Lord has shown himself to be trustworthy. So, how do we respond? What do we do going forward into 2024? Well, it's pretty simple. Let's entrust ourselves wholly to what God says. Brothers and sisters, let's revere and read and respond to the scriptures, the Bible, God's inspired word, knowing that he has spoken what is good for us, and that if we trust in what God says, we will not be disappointed. Our Cache Valley Bible Fellowship Statement of Faith says it so well. The Bible is to be believed in all that it teaches, obeyed in all that it requires, and trusted in all that it promises. That's the obvious implication that the Lord reigns. He's proven himself trustworthy, and he'll prove himself trustworthy again and again and again, so that we can sing afresh Again and again, the Lord reigns. He's robed in majesty. Secondly, we see in verse 5 that our proper response to the reign of God is worship. Holiness befits your house, O Lord, forevermore. The psalm is saying that given the fact that Yahweh reigns, and given the fact that he's robed in majesty, and given the fact that his kingdom ensures the stability of the world and our own lives, we ought to worship him with holiness in the way that he desires because he is worthy. In the Old Testament, the house of God was the temple. That's what this is referring to. The place that God desired his people to gather and worship him through sacrifices, through song, through symbols and rituals. And the temple also communicated the holiness of God, the holiness of God's people and God's purpose for the world which is to dwell among his people forever but in the new testament the true temple of god which fulfills what that temple in the old testament was pointing to and could never itself accomplish the true temple of god is the body of jesus christ and all of god's people the church are members of that body Living stones, Peter tells us, that are being built up into a spiritual temple that exists to worship God. That's why we're saved. It's why God has chosen us. It's why God has made us his people, so that he could dwell with us, a holy God with a holy people, and that we could proclaim his glories and worship his name forever. Worshiping God through Christ in the spirit of holiness is our fitting response to the saving reign of our holy God. It's the same conclusion that the author of Hebrews makes at the end of the book of Hebrews. In Hebrews 12, he says this in verse 28, Therefore, let us be grateful for receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken, and let us offer to God acceptable worship with reverence and awe. For our God is a consuming fire. So when we gather together as God's people in Christ's name, and when we worship God in spirit and in truth, not, on the, not approaching him on the basis of our own righteousness, but approaching him on the basis of the righteousness that's been given to us in Christ, and when we worship him with gratitude for all that he is and does for us, 
with reverence and awe. And when we live our lives devoted to his service, then we are worshiping the king in the holiness which is fitting and do him. And I want to encourage us. I believe as a church that that's what we're doing. We're gathering together in Christ's name. We're not here proclaiming how great we are. We're here proclaiming how great he is. We're not here trusting that I hope I've been good enough. We're here proclaiming Christ Jesus has died and is risen, and that's why we have hope. That's why we can come. And we're giving God all the glory. And we don't want to just sing. We want to go out and we want to live for him. That's the holiness. That's what sets us apart. That's what makes us different. And that is what is due to our awesome king. So what should we be doing in 2024? As a great many people are fearing the future, Psalm 93 speaks peace to our fears and wisdom to our perplexities. It's all going to be okay. That's what Psalm 93 says. God's purposes for this world and for his people will come to pass. So let's confidently trust in the Lord and continue unceasingly worshiping his holy name because when it seems like the world is falling apart and his purposes will fail, his unconquerable reign ensures that it won't. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for this word of comfort that you give us. We thank you for the goodness that is in Psalm 93 for us. And I pray that we would hear and respond to this, O oh Lord. I pray that as we leave here, as we live our lives, as we proceed through the rest of this tumultuous year, Lord, may we face whatever may come with the confidence that you reign and that we are secure in you. And in fact, this whole world is secure in you. Lord, we thank you that that's true and we worship you today. We worship you and give you glory in Jesus' name. Amen.